Hello and welcome to OT the Podcast. We're here to be your agony aunts of watches. Uh, we're here to talk about time. We're here to talk about how to spend it. My name's Felix Schultz. I'm testing out new intros. How do I go, Andy? Uh, not great. Probably should have thought about it a little bit, uh, a little bit longer. I'm obviously Andy Green. Felix, today we have a very exciting guest. Yep. Someone who's been on my radar and watches for probably like four or five years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Big name associated with Paul Newman. Um, mm. Of course, talking about Stan Burrett, who is the uh, famous Hollywood stuntman. He was the Hollywood stuntman, uh, according to my very detailed research. <laughs> he was also um, in, in a in a. Well, let's just say he was the fastest man on earth. This man has stories. We did, we spoke for an hour. I think it's like a one one of five parter, but the man has stories. And you know, you're talking about all of his work of you know basically a sixty year career, Felix. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how. Like, there were bits. Uh, it was a few weeks ago where we we chatted to him, but you know, like, and not to sort of give the game away, but he's like talking about you know he gets invited out to dinner and he, he's like yeah yeah cool whatever with with um with Paul Newman and the other guy at dinner is Marlon Brando. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or, how, or how you know the the story of how Paul Newman ended up staying at his you know his skiing condo for a week and giving him a car and all, all the watches of course he has a few uh few newman gifted uh rolexes gmt and of course the daytona which and is pretty of course exciting. a volvo the volvo i mean this is oh yeah my my ears lit up when he started talking yeah. about this volvo so yeah, yeah again i mean look we should stop talking about it now um get it to it. it it's we'll, we'll definitely have to have him back on and besides all this besides being really cool mm. a gentleman yep yeah yep, yep. oh what a lovely guy truly Lovely, lovely human to talk to. Um, Felix, I'm looking at what you've got in front of me. Yes, a couple of notes. A couple of notes. I see the name Larry David popping out. Mm-hmm. I included that just for you. Um, you, saw, you saw my Instagram story. Got a lot of good feedback on this Instagram story. I didn't. Sorry. You missed this. Okay. So as you know, mm. uh, here's my recommendation off the bat. Okay. Grand Designs. I mm-hmm. have been just thoroughly enjoying Grand Designs. Yep. Told you about it. And I'm watching it and started with a New Zealand series, kind of did what I could there. Now I'm back to Kevin McLeod, the OG, yep. UK series. And I'm sitting there watching it. The best. I'm and he, he's got, he's got you know, a lot of sass. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, Felix, Grand Designs, hosted by Larry David, probably the greatest TV show imaginable. Cursed. No, <laughs> that that curb your enthusiasm music plays every time you know they talk about the budget at the end and like the delays dun, 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 dun. to be honest uh, there's probably there's such a cult around kevin mcleod that there, there are probably edits out there already on I, if anyone has those skills that's listening i want to see it but it, but even you know the, the 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 hand gestures the you know he comes in at the end pretty 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 good like just all of that imagine larry david i put up an instagram story with the idea I love Kevin McLeod. He's fantastic. But I think Larry David hosting just even one episode. We'll, we'll get to my Rex in a second, but I've got another thing that I've been meaning to speak to you about um, sure. on the podcast. And I think it fits very much into both Kevin McLeod and Larry <laughs> David. Do you know what I'm going to ask you about? Uh, old white man, my dad? No, uh, chairs. Oh. You've okay. been uh, on, on your Instagram, Andy Green Live, mm. you're periodically throwing out, um, throwing heat, white hot heat, uh, at what you deem to be the worst chair designs. It's horrendous. Specifically, we're sort of talking classic. Um, classic cafe classic chair. Ones. It's that uh, It's that circle, circular back, no support, slippery base, you fall down, the back part pinches, you know, any back fat you might have. Just, you know, you turn up to a cafe or a venue or a restaurant, see that chair, I want to go. I don't want to be there anymore. And, but you also don't like the the pressed metal ones with the sort of stackable legs. The oh, the, um, the, the, the Torx oh. chair. Well, so I put up an Instagram story just like rant, ranting about this chair. I was like, this is the worst chair you could put in a cafe. And I had, I think, at least 45, 50 responses to that story, just in agreement. A few mm. people disagreed. And they said that sort of that pressed steel one, I think it's the Torx, maybe Torx chair. I have to find out. We'll link it up. Well, yeah, it's been around for like 60 years or something. Forever. It's, yep. it's really ugly, but could also look a bit industrial and okay. Super uncomfortable as well. And people actually disagreed. They said that was the worst. Oh, okay. I don't mind either, to be fair. I don't think I, I don't know. I think we need to, we need to dive into this. But this is the sort of niche content that I've been thriving on recently. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've talked to you about this, but I've recently got onto the best side of TikTok. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sandwich talk. Sandwich talk. Okay. 
I've just, uh, and I've never been like a big sort of foodie blogger sort of person. Like I don't, I don't take pictures of meals and put it on, on the gram. I don't do that. I don't read food blogs. I'm getting a recipe. I scroll past all the, you know, the, the text. But for some reason, there's this one guy, I believe his name is Jim Bamer. Uh, he, he tells stories about sandwiches that deeply speak to me. Um, and I found out he has a website, predominantly his website, called sandwichtribunal.com. Uh, where- Sandwich Tribunal. Yeah, he so apparently it's very like old school blog, which I think tickles me as well. Um, mm. So apparently there was like a Wikipedia list of all the sandwiches of the world and they went through making them. Okay. Um, so A, he sort of goes through the history, where it emerged from, and he does the cooking. Like it's it's very, very good. Like uh, he'll talk about, you know, the bread. He'll talk about the, the contrast. He'll talk about, you know, all the different ingredients, where, you know, a bit of the history of the sandwich. Um. And, you know, it's it's compelling. I mean, there was, you know, I've learned more about, you know, Taiwanese sandwiches and, you know, Middle Eastern wrapped meat things. And it's, you can just go into a, a great deal of depth about the humble sandwich. <laughs> What's your favorite? What's your go-to sandwich? Well, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty uh, uh, plain at home, I guess. I do like, you know, your tomato, tomato cheese. It's a good combination. Bit of mayonnaise, bit of mustard. Different, like obviously different moods for, for different foods. Um, but, yeah, what about you, man? Do you have a regular sandwich? Look, I don't, I don't do too much, but I'll do a peanut butter sandwich. I was about to say, peanut butter, soft white bread, good combo. It's all you need. It's all you need, a little bit of PB. Mm-hmm. Jam if you're feeling fancy. <laughs> um, another thing I'm looking forward to, this is, again, a preemptive recommendation. It's a, a TV show. Um, we've been talking about it on our Discord a little bit. Uh, I noticed you were conspicuously absent in that chat, Andy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Peripheral, uh, okay. which is an Amazon series coming out in a couple of weeks as of time of recording, uh, based on a book by a guy called William Gibson, who's a sci-fi writer that sort of evolved over time and – this is a part of a series of books he's written. He wrote three books um, and sort of had to rewrite the last one several times because it was published during Donald Trump's presidency uh, and all the stuff that he was predicting in this sure. new future was just happening. <laughs> he was too accurate. Yeah. Well, he's like, you know, he'd write the start of the book about a, you know, dystopian America. Oh, shit, just went and happened, didn't it? Um, so yeah, peripheral, put the link to the, the trailer up. It's going to be good. I can say it already. Can't wait, Felix. Mm. Uh, you know what else is good? What? The new heat coming out of William Wood watches. <sighs> Firefighting watches, uh, fearless watches. What are we, what are we, what are we looking at here? Well, obviously William would have been great supporters of OT from the, from the early days of the show. Uh, this isn't an ad. They've just done something cool that we thought we would uh, yeah. bring up quickly. They've, they've released a new collection. They've released uh, their first Field Watch collection called the Fearless Collection, Fearless Field Watches. Uh, there's three of them, black cases, uh, 40 mil, which I think is good, make it a mm. little bit smaller. That's what the kids want. Uh, PVD cases, quite striking. You know, there's three sort of main colorways at the moment, uh, mm. and uh, which – is echoed not just in the cases. So you've got the a bright color, you know, red, yellow, orange chapter ring. Mm. Also got it on the straps, which are made from the old recycled fire hoses. Black this time. Really black. I mean, the only colorful touches are on the, the stitching on the strap. Yeah. Uh, the rehaul and I guess the hands. And the dial, the dial hardware is pretty colorful. But do you know what else is super cool? The case back. Case back, man. Um, so they're powered by a Seiko movement, which is mm-hmm. just absolutely fine. And it's not normally the sort of – I always find at a, at a watch price like this, mm. it's a challenge of like do you show the movement, do you not show the movement? Because to be honest, there's nothing particularly special for me in that movement. Yeah. But if I was buying this for someone or if I was just buying one nice watch, I'd want to be able to see the movement and show it off. Mm, mm. I think mm. William Wood has come to a very, very good middle ground here where they've come up with this super stylized, like contemporary looking firefighter helmet. With a bit of a portal. It's got a visor. Visor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tinted visor. That matches the the dial color, I guess, or the red color. so. Um, and you can see a little bit of the, the rotor moving in there without, you know. That's all you need, a little yeah. portal to the movement. I think that's uh, I think that's cool. I think these watches actually look quite cool, I have to say. And I like the the variation of just the subtle color change. Like it's... Look, really, you know, have to, uh, 
maybe we'll have to get one on our wrists at some point in the future. I quite like, I'm hoping to come up with like a green or like a, a khaki tan sort of one. I can really see that popping too. Yeah. But uh, or William Wood Watchers, we'll link it up, 895 pounds. Okay, so about 1,500, 1,600 Aussie. Speaking of fire, Felix, mm. do you know who's probably been set on fire more times than we can say William Wood? Uh, no. I reckon today's guest, Stan Barrett, stunt man, jump man, fire man. I reckon, he's, uh, I reckon he's got some stories. You know what we've got to talk about before we get to big man Stan and he's he up. firing plan? Yeah. Adam Straps, mate. Oh, of course. We can't. We can, we cannot let an episode go by without, again, shouting to the rafters. Uh, our mm. friends at Adam Strap and their incredible sailcloth collections and NATOs. Yeah, lest we forget the NATOs. Uh, check them out. Artem Straps on Instagram. Artem Straps on the internet in general. Uh, Artemstraps.com, I should say. Yeah, uh, sure blue Loopless right. Sailcloth. That's what they're they're all about at the moment. Still got black as well. If that's more your vibe. Tell you what, they've got some black PVD hardware. I reckon that would um. Probably rock on those William Wood Fields collection pieces. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I, a collab, get a recycled fire sail off <laughs> strap. Let's make fire it. out. All right, let's get on to Stan, Andy. Let's do it. Stan the man. Today's guest is a stunt man, a racer. In fact, the fastest man on the, on the land at one point. What more of an intro do you really need? He's a certified daredevil, an icon of Hollywood, and it's an absolute honor to have him on the podcast. Stan Barrett, welcome to welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. No, no, it's it's our, our absolute pleasure, and we really appreciate you you coming on. And uh, one of our former guests, David Con Cannon, doing the the kind introduction to you. You know, he kind of mentioned you in the the interview we had with him, and we said we we need to get Stan on. And there's a few things we want to talk to you about. Um, watches, obviously, your career because it's very interesting. But I think because we are a watch podcast, we should start there. Uh, start with watches, and I think the place to probably start is your relationship with Paul Newman. He gave you a few watches. You had a friendship that spanned 40 years. But what can you tell us about that relationship? My relationship with Paul started in 1970 on a movie called um, Sometimes a Great Notion, which I really wasn't going to go on. It was up in Oregon, and I was under contract to Burt Reynolds on a TV series. Mm -hmm. And so I I got a call from my (coughs) answering service asking me, you know, saying that... um, Paul Newman's office was on the phone and wanted to talk to me, and they, so I got on there and and it, they asked me if I could come up and double Paul uh, in a motorcycle sequence, and I said, you know, I'm a huge fan of Paul's, but I'm under contract here, and um, you know, I, I can't do it. You know, I've never broken a contract, and so mm-hmm. they said, okay, and uh, then I, I get a call back again and they said are you sure you can't get off for a few days and I said no and so then Bert comes over to me and he goes because he was a producer on the show and he said Stan you dummy he said I want to meet Paul Newman he said go up there and I said okay I'll go if you uh, take me off of salary and put Hal Needham on in my place who was my mentor as a stuntman and who eventually uh, bought me the rocket car and NASCAR team and so on and so I drove up to Bishop, California, where I was living, loaded up my motorcycles and drove all night up there. Mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, I uh, actually, I it was kind of funny. I didn't really talk to Paul very much. He wanted, I mean, the stunt coordinator on the show wanted to show him how good it, I could ride a bike. And so I, he asked me to wheelie down the road and I did and came <laughs> back, which was kind of, you know, weird. I don't like doing stuff like that. So anyhow, I, uh, his brother was there and he was a huge fan of my ex-wife's who was, had been on the Olympic team skiing mm-hmm. and he, he was a skier himself and my father-in-law owned Mammoth Mountain, a huge ski area. And so he, uh, we went to dinner with him and, um, I didn't really have much to do with Paul and then he broke his ankle. I had ruptured a disc on my back laying down a bike up there and I was at the hospital and he... Uh, started my bike and broke his ankle and oh. so it, that was the second day I the first day uh, uh, I finished the day went and had injections in my back and the next morning I was supposed to go back and get the injections again and I told Paul stay away from my bike because this is a factory Husqvarna and it has got so much compression and it'll back kick you and break your leg and <laughs> He didn't listen, and um, it ended up breaking his ankle, and they shut down the show. So mm-hmm. then I went home, and um, 
you know, started in on the series again. And I was out practicing on my racing bike and tore up my knee. And about, oh, I guess three or four weeks later, uh, so I had to, I had to get Hal to take over the rest of the show for, for me with Bert. And I guess four weeks later, so I get a call from my mother-in-law. And she said, Paul Newman's office is trying to get a hold of you. And I said, okay. So they, <clears throat> I called and um, Paul's secretary, Maggie, an old sweet old gal, um, put Paul on and Paul said, how's your leg? I heard you tore up your leg. And I said, yeah, it's okay. And he said, well, I was going to come up and go skiing with you. Uh, and I said, well, you can ski with my wife and my father-in-law. And I said, how long would you come up for? He said, oh, just a day. And I said, okay. I said, Do you, is Joanne coming with you? And he said, no. And I said, well, you want a hotel or a condo or what would you like? And he said, do you have room for me to stay with you? Oh. I said, yeah, we just got a, we got a new condominium, but, you know, a couple of bedrooms, but you're welcome. And he ended up staying seven days and that was started our friendship. Wow. So, and it was kind of funny because I had to drug him to get him to leave. You know, I had to give him <laughs> acidil one night and that scared him. He said, I got, I've never slept like this before. He said, I'm I home and get checked out because my ex-wife was having a fit that he and I were having so much fun together. And, and I had ended up cutting off the cast the last couple of days to ski with him. And uh, so that's that's how I met Paul. And then we did uh, uh, Judge Roy Bean the mm -hmm. next, uh, in a couple of weeks or so, a month. And But he was always coming out and staying with me. And then uh, he'd fly me back to be with him back there. And, you know, it was just a fantastic friendship we had. Sounds amazing. And I guess over those years you, you discovered that you shared you know, beyond skiing and motorcycles, you had quite a few other shared passions and interests. And what were they? What did you guys bond over? Actually, we didn't. I oh. mean, he was a really a huge liberal. In fact, his his greatest honor was to be on the top ten most wanted list on Nixon's uh, most wanted list. And here I was a you know uh, a Reagan friend and fan, and um, you know. He was not a Christian. I was a strong Christian. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> I don't know how you, you know, it was kind of funny, but we never had an argument or crossword or, you know, about any of that stuff. So, uh, you know, I would, I would kid him sometimes, you know, and, uh, but he was, he was great. And, and what was it like having um, such a good long friendship with someone that you also had to work with, you know, and sort of, manage that those those boundaries was it ever sort of difficult or was it all part of the same friendship it was really all part of the same friendship you know he admired me um so much i think and the fact that i was one of the top stunt guys in the business and and so on and uh you know uh bert was probably the biggest action star and i was doubling him and you know i was doing all the big stunts for hal needham and other pictures and uh and so I was kind of different, you know, I was a uh, very, very milk toast kind of a guy. And, uh, you know, I didn't, um, he got me drinking some beer and, uh, but otherwise I was pretty straightforward. You know, I didn't go for any of the uh, nonsense with marijuana and all the drugs the stunt guys were using. So, you know, in fact, the only one time it was kind of funny on, on Judge Roy Bean, I'm in wardrobe and he's he's on the porch of the the vinegar room saloon and I'm sitting over away from the set and he keeps looking at me and he keeps watching everything I'm doing and I'm going boy this is weird I said maybe he doesn't like me being here I I, did, I couldn't understand it you know and so finally I went over to him and I said hey Paul I said is something wrong he said, no nothing's wrong I said well, you keep watching me and all the time I said uh, am I doing something what's the deal he said oh he said I'm just studying you I love the way you move and I went oh you gotta be kidding me <laughs> Paul Newman saying that to me anyhow but that was the only time I, I was uncomfortable but uh, you know I did you know a lot of stunts on the thing and ended up directing the second unit uh, 
on the end of the picture and uh you know it was great you know he he just always like with uh john houston the director he just he always built me up and he was the one that talked john and he said let stan take over the ending and i hadn't directed second unit i didn't have my part but i ended up doing it and uh you know, so it was a big, big action thing. And uh, so anyhow, but we had, you know, we'd go to dinner every night together. In fact, one night was kind of funny. We're uh, going to dinner and he says, uh, hey, he said, we're going to have some people join us. And I said, okay. Mm. He goes, well, uh, aren't you curious to who it is? And I said, no, it doesn't matter. And he said, okay. So we're sitting in the dining room and behind the curtains, they curtained off an area for us. And um, the curtain, uh, the major D guy comes up and he says, so your guests are here, Mr. Newman. And so he opens the curtain and in walks this beautiful Polynesian girl. And I go, whoa. And then behind her is Marlon Brando. And I'll tell you what, that, I wasn't necessarily a big fan of Marlins. I thought he was a great actor, but that was to see those two guys together was like seeing Patton and Eisenhower together. Mm. I mean, they had so much um, the the energy between those two guys was amazing. I, I'm sorry that they didn't do a movie together. Um, you know, uh, he was supposed to do Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and ended up not doing it. Then it was. Then it went to McQueen, and McQueen turned it down, and then uh, that's when uh, Redford got it. But, Imagine, I'm just imagining yeah. the what, what that movie could have been like. It was already yeah. incredible with, with Redford and Newman, but huh. I think it would have been believable. But, you know, not to take anything away from Redford, um, you know, Redford's, uh, he was good for the part, you know. Mm. And I ended up dating the girl, Catherine Ross. I ended up dating her later on. Let's see, it was later or before then. Yeah, I think it was uh, it was on Hellfighters. So that was in 1968, I think, 67 or 68. And I don't remember when Butch Cassidy was done. Um, but it was before we became friends. Uh-huh. Anyhow, Paul would tell me all kinds of stories, you know, about... It was funny. It was like, it was like Paul never had a friend he could really talk to. And, you know, we'd go, we'd play pool, we'd take whirlpools, and, and we'd talk till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And that's what made my wife so mad. Then we'd get up early and go do our thing and ski or whatever. Then we'd go down to Bishop and he'd play tennis and we'd ride motorcycles and, uh, and then go back up and do the whole thing with, we'd have dinner and then do the whirlpool uh, uh, or play ping pong and uh, pool and then <laughs> it was non-stop with us so it was just a lot of fun and I <clears throat> like I say I don't think he had a had a friend before that he could really trust and uh, feel comfortable with you know? yeah and I, I kind of want to add D into to that relationship and the dynamic a little bit more just because you know you, you you we've been chatting for a little while now and you're very sort of you're a, you're a daredevil and you're a stuntman and an incredibly high high risk career. Uh, and then it's also sort of your job to protect, you know, as a stunt coordinator, protect the cast and the crew and do whatever you can. And, you know, that that's your friend. But then there's that inverse of the relationship where, you know, Paul would care a lot about you. And so what was that like sort of balancing, you know, I, the stunts and the, the risk, you know, both ways? And, you know, obviously caring about your friend and not wanting them to get hurt and him not wanting you to get hurt. And, you know, what, what was that like? Was it ever tricky on that front? Well, only one time that I can remember, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, he he trusted me so much and he just wanted to watch what I was doing because I did things a lot different than most stunt guys did. And I was really in good shape. And, uh, you know, I, I planned things out and, you know, I was pretty uh, calm about everything I did. Like Paul said, this kid doesn't rattle. And uh, so, but one time we're on a picture called uh, Drowning Pool. And we've got a scene to do it where I'm thrown out back where my hands are tied behind me and I'm in the back of a limo with this gal and the guy slows down in front of this place and she takes, puts her 
arms under my legs are together and flips me out on my head on from this limo and he did not like that at all he he's and that's the first time i ever saw him have too much to drink you know we finished our daytime scenes and so we go to dinner and um uh, uh, then you know we wait for it to get dark and paul's drinking like a fish and so he said i'm going to do the stunt he said and i said paul you can't do the stunt mm. i said i'm the stunt man and i'm I'm the guy that's supposed to do this. No, no, I, I want to do my own stuff here. I said, absolutely not, Paul, you can't do it. And I had a heck of a time, you know, uh, um, corralling him on that. But I said, why do you want to, he said, I'm afraid you're going to get hurt. I said, then what's going to happen to you? <laughs> and if I get hurt, they'll get on that stunt, man. But if you get hurt, what do they do? I said, you got a big responsibility here to a lot of people. So just relax. And anyhow, but you know, we could talk about things, and, but that's the only time that we ever had a, had a deal like that. Stan, you said a little uh, uh, a while ago that you did things very different to, to other sort of stuntmen of the time. What do you mean by that? Well, I was very calm and, um, you know, I didn't get excited about a stunt and or before or after, you know, like a lot of guys after a stunt, the stunts on a did yell and scream and yeah, carry on. I never did that. Um, I just looked at things in a certain way and I would, uh, you know, approach it a certain way and I'd do it. And I didn't make a big deal out of anything. I just would go in and get my, get the job done. And, you know, it's just like nothing to me. And I've always been like that. And I think that's probably things that attracted Paul, you know, and, and the other stunt guys respected me so much. And so that helped, I guess, a lot too. You know, I had been in stunts, uh, the Stuntman's Association, and mm -hmm. then we went to Stuntman's Association, Hal Needham and several of us guys and started Stunts Unlimited. And then I ended up quitting Stunts Unlimited because the guys were using drugs and they just did things differently than I wanted to. And Hal Needham was really upset that I was going to quit. And he tried to talk me out of it because part of our bylaws were that you could not uh, hire anybody that was out of stunts unlimited. Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, when I quit, I mean, it was tough, man. I mean, I, you know, I can remember driving home to Bishop and I said, well, there goes my career. I said, I just blew it. And, uh, you know, and that's right after that's when I started doubling Paul and I went to, uh, uh, Jamaica to double, uh, Steve McQueen and I had that series with Bert and it just seemed like I kept getting busier and busier. So um, worked, out, worked out well for you. One thing we we you know we learned about Paul Newman in the in sort of the last decade in the in the watch industry in particular is how he loved um, watches and how he loved giving them and loved engraving them and and giving them out to people. We had James Cox uh, on the show. About two years ago now, Felix, who received a Daytona from him with a very famous um, treehouse building story that you know I'm sure you saw sold for about seventeen million million dollars back in I think 2017, and you know when we heard about you and we heard about your watches and and some of the watches that um, Paul gave you with with engravings as well, uh, it's become apparent that he had a particular view on on watches and and. Possibly they were, you know, special gifts, and there was some sentimentality there. But what what do you know about Paul Newman and watches? And you know, before we talk about the watches he gave you, do you know why he gave out watches? I don't know. I think you know, Paul was uh, he was so private of a person, and um, he didn't really give a lot of gifts or celebrate a lot of things. He called me one time in Thanksgiving and he said, I hope you know that uh, you're one of two calls that I'm making. Well, wow. And I said, no, he said, I'm calling my brother Arthur and you. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's, I mean, I kind of blew me away in a way, but he just, you know, we had exchanged Christmas presents, but he wouldn't exchange Christmas presents with anybody, really. Mm, so, so that makes it more know, special. I, yeah, I mean, he'd send me stuff, and I'd send him stuff, and, um, you know, his always had some funny caption on him, you know, uh, but anyhow, he was, uh, and as far as the watches go, 
um, you know, that watch went to Nell had been wearing it for a long time, his daughter, and then Jimmy ended up with it for some reason or other. I don't know whether what the deal was on that, um, but he always had. He was a real Rolex fan, you know. Um, he gave me a couple of digital watches uh, as well, and one of them, I, I don't know what I did with the one uh, because it, the um, face I right, busted the plasma in there, but I've still got the other one too. And then he he gave me a Breitling, but he told me, <laughs> he said, hey, enjoy this watch, but don't wear it in front of uh, Bruce Willis because I think he gave it to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I still got that too, and uh, you know everything he gave me, I really treasured. So we'll have to check with Bruce Willis <laughs> if it's okay. If, if yeah. it's okay for you to wear now. Yeah, but he had two of them, and he actually gave one to to uh, uh, Mike Brockman, a friend of his who passed away last year, and he said the same thing. He told him the same thing. So, but I was the only one he gave any Rolexes to that I know of, any friend, and uh, you know he was. It was unbelievable there. So you ended up with with a couple of uh, a couple of GMT Masters, a couple of Rolex GMT yeah. Masters, and a I, da- Daytona. No, I ended up with a Daytona mm-hmm. and a GMT Master, and then August Bush gave me that uh, gold GMT Master and engraved it after I did the rocket car. Yeah, th- that's right. That's kind of an interesting story. My dad was many things an inventor and a preacher and a chiropractor and a, but he was a railroad engineer for you know since he was a young guy and i used to go down and ride his train up into anheuser bush into their um gated area where he'd pick up budweiser and his train and take it across the uh, bridge into alton and it was funny that that's where and i thought that was a big deal when i was 17 you know yeah got my going in this place riding my dad's train and man i'm a lucky guy and then 20 years later i've got the rocket car in there and the, the august bush is presenting me with a gold watch <laughs> so it was kind of kind of interesting and and these watches sort of obviously from from special people in your life or sort of sell you know about special occasions or you know achievements did, did you wear them were they were they special yeah. to you or did you just use them to tell the time no, I, I wore them and then my son wore the the uh, Daytona for years and years. He wore that. And finally, you know, after Paul sold for so much money, I said, you know, I don't want you wearing that anymore. I said, they'll cut off your wrist for it. You know, people know what that's worth now. He wasn't real happy about it, but he understood. And I said, you know, we need to get rid of these watches and they're not doing any good, you know, on our wrist. Um, you know, we, we can do a lot with these watches with their charities. So that was the decision that was made. Yeah. And, 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 and that's fair enough. I guess, what did they, what was that decision like for you? Cause th- these were such special gifts, um, you know, f- for you as milestones, right. Uh, from, you know, your best friend of 40 years, what was that decision like to say, y- you know, and you just said it, they're not, then they're, they're no, they're doing no good on our wrists. Let's sell them and let's use the money for our charities. But but what was that an easy decision? What did you what did you feel kind of? Um... I mean, it wasn't it wasn't you know I mean mm. it. Uh, uh, I had given the the one watch to my son to wear the GMT Master, and he ended up giving it back to me because uh, you know he didn't want to wear it anymore. And I actually gave it to him to wear it, and I said you know as a wedding deal, I said hey this is commitment, man. I said you know I wore this in a rocket car. And I said, I want you to think of this watch as part of your commitment. Well, he divorced her. And so he gave me the watch back. <laughs> well, that's, but you God, know, yeah. Deal's a deal. He, was, he wasn't wearing it anyhow. I mean, yep. he, he would buy expensive, expensive watches. And, uh, of course, now he, he would like to have one. Mm. Um, but, so let's talk about the – sorry. Paul's – I've got Paul's station wagon, the Volvo, on the garage. And do you? I've got to let go of it. And I, I hate to do that in a way because I love that car and we had so many great experiences in it. You've got the turbo. But You've got the turbo wagon. I've got the Volvo wagon, yeah. Because so he, he bought one and Letterman got one, right? No, that was the first one. He oh, built that's the first up one. a own Ford. Uh-huh. And... Um, 
So he uh, he and Litterman both had one, and that car was you know it was fast. Mm. He, it, he originally it had a um, a stick in it, and uh, or an automatic, and he changed it to a stick. And uh, you know I drove that car a lot, but you know he, it spent half the time on the uh, like he said on the uh, um, you know the flatbed. <laughs> mm. He says spends more time on a flatbed than it does me driving it. So then, then he had a, um, had this Volvo, he had the Volvo dealership with his Brockman in Connecticut. And so the president of Volvo came over and when he had that Ford and he said, Paul, you need to be driving a pure Volvo, not a Volvo Ford. And he said, I'll send over a new one. And, and, Paul said, I don't like the front wheel drives. And he said, well, we'll get a four wheel. He said, no. He said, I like a rear wheel drive car. And they quit making those in 98. And this is like in 2000. And so they he, they got on the lookout for a 98 Volvo. And they found one with 6,000 miles on it in Chicago. And, uh, an old lady had it, I guess. And, and they brought it back. They shipped an engine over and... Um, an engineer and a mechanic and they spent a fortune mirroring that engine into that car and it is a rocket ship but they had to build a lot of parts for it and so on that's amazing that's amazing oh, i'm gonna i'm we're gonna have to have a, a completely separate chat about this this volvo but the auction so sotheby's is selling off the daytona the gmt master steel and the gold gmt master that you got at yeah december i think it was december 9th of this year Sotheby, so we'll link all that stuff up. What's the so? What's the the purpose? What are you using the the, the funds for? Or some of the funds for? You said a good cause and some charities. What are you What are you hoping to do with um you know with a lot, the, of, a lot of stuff in Ukraine? And Paul helped me a lot in Ukraine with a couple of orphanages and the hospital in Kiev, and then we started a, or took over a camp kind of in uh, uh, Belarus for kids from Chernobyl, and so. I want to continue, um, you know, with that in mind, you know, I'm going to do a lot of, a uh, lot more work there. I've been supporting him myself, you know, since Paul uh, died, but I mean, not to the extent that we did it. And, uh, you know, we did so many things in Africa and Bosnia and Kosovo and all over the place, you know, a lot of stuff in Africa. I don't know that I'll go back to Africa and, and do much because of, you know, it seemed like we built two clinics up in, in um, Kajabi, up in the, where the pygmies are, and they were destroyed twice. And um, then down in um, Nankundi, we helped the uh, hospital down there, and it was destroyed. We rebuilt part of it. And, you know, you just, I think Africa seems that was in the Congo, but it seems to be just a, you know, might as well throw your money in the toilet and flush it down. You know, it seems like they don't, I can't believe the rebels and the, you know, stuff that goes on over there. So, I mean, but look at Kiev, you know, I mean, look at Ukraine, yeah. you know, I helped a lot in Russia as well. Uh, orphanages in Russia, but Ukraine was my kind of my main, I liked Ukraine people better than I did the Russian people. And, but I enjoyed the kids in both places. You know, the kids were always great. And um, and the people that I worked with over there were great too, but I don't know, it was just a little different. Ukraine was just different. And, uh, you know, you get this, you start going to, I've been over there 10 times, I'll bet, and, uh, or more, and you start really developing friendships and, you know, you kind of feel at home over there. So. Anyhow, I think one of the things I got so dang sick and I got SARS and uh, and Russian thought I was going to die over there, you know. And so I couldn't wait to get <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> but anyhow, so uh, it's more of a, a personal prejudice against Russia. Yeah, I guess so. You know, it's uh, one of those things. But the people were just so different, and uh, I mean, not to say there were some really good people in. Russia, but Belarus and, and um, you know, the camp there was great. And, you know, Chernobyl really had an impact on me, you know, uh, 
because mm. of the what it did to the children. You know, that was the main thing. Um, you know, kids are affected by radiation much more than adults are. And uh, I can remember the last thing Paul gave was a, a sonogram. And I took it into Belarus and, I, and he was sick. You know, he was in the hospital and out of the hospital. And so I took it in there and, I, and then I came back and, and stayed with him until the time when it was in, uh, he was kind of losing his dignity and I left then. But I stayed with him, you know, he wanted, he, he didn't necessarily want his brother around him. He just wanted me there. So I spent a lot of time with him. Hmm. You know, for a, for a couple of straight guys, we had a really cool relationship. You know, it's kind of like Jonathan and David in the Bible, I think. But, uh, you know, I loved Paul like, like uh, you know, myself. I mean, he was just, he was just great. We just had such a great relationship. You know, I don't care what's going on on a set. I'd walk on a set and he'd put whatever he's doing, come over and give me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek, you know. And uh, he was always really seemed to be overjoyed to see me. And that was just, nobody else was like that with him. That's great. I mean, I think if you find someone like that in your life, like a, a friend like that, you, you stick with them because uh, they'll be there for you, you know throughout that, it obviously that's me to you felix i mean hopefully hopefully <laughs> we, can, I, we can only only dream um you know it was only one time we had any kind of a difference and that was on a picture called harry and son and the opening was supposed to be a big scene with cranes and wrecking balls and everything and so he was going back to the academy awards and uh, this was like on a saturday and he was going to leave Sunday or whatever, Saturday. I don't know when the Academy Awards were. And then he was going to come back and start shooting on Monday. And so we're having a big meeting and, and I want to talk about what's going on, you know, and what we're doing because I got to rig all this stuff up. And so I said, you know, finally I said, uh, Paul, maybe we better get Ron Buck, the associate, I mean, the other producer over here and, and, and get a second opinion on what, you know, get his opinion on what we should do. And I didn't say second opinion. I said uh, an opinion, too, on what we should do. And he said, look, I don't need a second opinion. I've been in this business 50 or 40 years, and uh, I don't need a second opinion. And I said, okay, Paul. I said, listen. I said, um, you're the one that called me to come down here and do this film. I don't need this film. And I said, if you don't need me, I'm going home. And he doesn't say anything. And so we end the meeting and I leave and he leaves and I'm, I'm going, what in the heck? I've never seen him like that. And uh, so I was ready to go home. And uh, so come Monday morning, the, um, I, I had heard that Paul got back, that the, they flew him back, and come Monday morning, uh, the producer, the other producer, the line producer, comes over and he said, Stan, he said, um, you need to go out and start shooting. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, Paul's here, but uh, you need to go out and start shooting. And mm. I said, what do you want to shoot? He said, anything you want to shoot. So I went out there and I did some pretty, pretty cool things. I mean, I took, I took um, doors off the hotel the inside and put them out and put the camera inside and hit the wrecking ball and knock stuff right down. And it looked like it was going right into the camera, but it was going into that, those mirrors outside. And I did all kinds of stuff. And so about noon, Paul comes out. And so the assistant director said, hey, Paul wants to see you in his dressing room. I go, oh. So I go in his dressing room and he goes, hey, man. And he gave me a big hug and he said, hey, I, I, I got to tell you something. He said, I am so sorry about the other day. He said, it's the first time I've ever been caught with my pants down. Mm. He said, I didn't 
not have a clue of what to do. And he said, I'm just so thankful I had a friend like you that, that could see this through. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know. I mean, that was really a humbling t- for him to admit that, you know. And here he's a big star, and but he's my friend too. But then he goes, I said, well, Paul, he said, I hear you've been doing fantastic. He said, uh, I said, well, come on out and take over. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm going to come out and watch what you're doing and, and try to learn. And, you know, I mean, that was the only time we ever had any kind of a difference. And stronger for it. Oh, what a lovely story. Hey, um, we want to talk about the Buzz, Budweiser Rocket car. You know, there's a there's a, a whole bunch of stuff to talk about there. And, and that does tie back to the to the watches because, you know, you mentioned um, they have some special engravings tying back to that event for you. But i got to there's ask. No, I, I don't think there's – he just – the engravings on the rocket car are just the speed. Yeah. I think, and I don't know if it's on the Daytona. I'd have to look. I didn't even pay any attention to that. Uh, <laughs> you have to check right. it. But what I want to ask you, I heard I heard you had a particular track that you listened to to prepare for your high speed runs. What was your prep? Yeah, that was, that's stupid. It was called the Music Box Dancer by uh, Frank Mills in, uh, from Canada, and it it was just as you know actually. I had heard the song before and it really kind of, it was just a pickup kind of song. And, and so I went into Salt Lake the day before we started running and I bought a, I bought a tape recorder and I bought that, that tape. And so actually I bought it to my, my little daughter. She was always a little ballerina, you know, and, uh, but anyhow, long story short is, um, uh, it just picked me up every time I'd hear that song, man. It would just, I don't know. It just, uh, I don't know what it did to me, but uh, okay, in fact, ready. Some, sometimes when my one son hears that, he'll start, tears will start coming in his eyes, you know. But anyhow, it's it kind of funny, but that, that was my go fast song. And I used that, you know, on every run in the rocket car because I'd get in the van to go out there, not at Bonneville, but at the other times at Edwards and um, you know there'd be a bunch of people on the van and stuff and I didn't want to talk I just wanted to think about what I was going to do and so I'd put that song on and you know everybody would be quiet and I just listened to go fast music you know and I did that when I before qualifying at uh, Daytona and different places I'd listen to my it'd say his uh, uh, go fast music you know the guys <laughs> huh. I love it I love it. So there's a pretty crazy story around this this run. Um, there was a sidewinder missile attached to the side of the rocket car that you you know you're going for the uh, the attempt at breaking the sound barrier, and you had to manually engage it at over 600 miles an hour, which I don't know what that is in kilometers, but I don't know probably a lot, a, lot, a thousand. Uh, and the well, I'm told the nerds wanted to make it engage automatically, but you refused. And how yeah. how actually backed you up and, and said let's do this manual. Yeah, I mean it was a deal where you had to hit it at six hundred and forty miles an hour at a, at a certain exactly a certain place by the computer, you know. And uh, so I said no, I'm not going to have that thing fired. Uh, you know, I'm driving the car and I'm the driver, and uh, you know I want it to be me that does this, you know that does it not some machine or computer and uh they and the scientist ray van aiken who i became great friends with and but bill fredrickson had said there's no way humanly possible you can do that you're going to be traveling at over a thousand feet a second and and uh, to hit that at, you know you've got to hit it within 150 feet you've got a window i think it was 150 feet i know i'll have to look and um, there's no way you can do that. And I, and I said, I can do it. And so Hal goes, and I mean, they're raising, they're, they're really adamant, you know. And so Hal goes, Stan, can you do it? And I said, yeah. And he goes to Bill, he's, and he said, my friend, my money, my car, if he says he can do it, he can do it. Huh. And if you look at the film on it, I hit it at exactly the flag they set up. I told him, I said, you set up a flag, um, a, a big flag, and I'll hit it exactly there. And so I just knew I could, you know, I, I'll, 
Hal was always amazed at my timing anyhow, but I just knew I could do it. And, uh, you know, I mean, if there had been any question in my mind, then I probably wouldn't have done it. But I, I had no questions about my ability to do it. That's incredible. So that's like one tenth of a second accuracy when you're traveling uh, that far. What what is that sort of speed like on your you know on your body and on you know your person? Well, it's really hard to explain. You know, it's kind of funny. The press conference in L.A. they they're really drilling me. You know, and they're all big breed love fans and gavelets and stuff. And, they said, well, how fast have you gone before? How fast have you driven? And I said, uh, or they said, how fast have you gone? I said, 180 miles an hour, maybe. But I said, Paul Newman was driving, and it was in a Can-Am car. <laughs> and, and they go, whoa, well, how fast have you driven? I said, oh, probably 140. And they said, well, what what qualifies you then to go for this sound barrier and the land speed record? I said, I don't know. You have to ask Tal Needham. He's the one driving you drive it. And so that was kind of funny. But, you know, then after a week, you know, I'm the fastest guy that's ever been to Bonneville, you know. So uh, anyhow, it was But the first run. I ran 350 miles an hour. And if I thought and I'm glad I didn't say anything. But when I came back, everybody's so excited. And they said, do you know how fast you went? And I'm going, I look at it. I could have said. 700 miles an hour i mean or i broke the land speed record or whatever and i i shut up you know uh, for some reason i didn't say nothing and i just shook my head they said uh 350 miles an hour and i went you gotta be kidding me <laughs> I, said, I, that fast. I mean i i couldn't believe how fast that was so i mean it was amazing that speed you know i mean i went you gotta be kidding me yeah, right. So, what, yeah, one yeah. thing that, that, that you've sort of talked a little bit about is you seem like, uh, certainly with your work, with the, with the stunt work, incredibly confident. Like, uh, you know, ego is often like uh, seen as a bad thing, but you're like, I can do this. I, I have the ability. Well, Could I, was, have... never, I was never an ego guy. I was always really humble. And, you know, I think it was from my upbringing. I mean, I went to 17 different schools when I was a kid or more. And, um, you know, I mean, I won the Golden Gloves when I was 15, and that kind of changed my life. Huh. Uh, then all through the service, I was, you know, boxing and undefeated. And then I was a black belt, a couple styles of karate. And so, but all my friends were always officers. And it was kind of funny, doctors and, and where I worked and, you know, I mean, I, I was real mature for my age and um, I, uh, but I was never an ego guy. You know, I mean, I was very, I think because of my upbringing, I was pretty humble. And that kind of, that kind of, my kids would always say to me, dad, you're too humble. You know, why don't you, and I'd say, you know, it's I'm just an ordinary guy with extraordinary, um, chances and uh, opportunities and I said so you know what have I got to be uh, uh, proud about you know so I'm proud of you guys or I'm proud of this and that but I'm not proud of myself or you know you know well, I don't even it sounds like you figured out the the secret um to a long Hollywood stuntman career because you know 50 plus years doubled for Paul Newman, Robert Redford, Steve McQueen, uh, an enormous list of films with an enormous list of roles. I don't think anyone has the full list, but, but you'll probably know. You know, And we've sort of talked about a couple of the films just through conversation and, you know, Papillon, uh, Butch, and the, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids. You've, you've really had a really uh, amazing career uh, in Hollywood uh, and, and yeah, it sounds Hooper like you figured out. Sorry? Probably Hooper was the biggest. Yep. That film I did, doubling Burt Reynolds on that, because I did some pretty, pretty dead gun dangerous stunts and, you know, stunts that haven't been done since. And, uh, you know, but I, I had a confidence in myself, not that I wasn't concerned about them, because a couple of them I said, oh man, you know. And, and, and actually, the first time I sat in a rocket car, it was in a uh, transporter, and Bill Fredericks put me in there. He said, you got to. 
you better think about what you're about to do and this and that and so on. And, and so I'm sitting in there and I'm going, man, I may just have written a check I can't cash. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in that thing and it's so confined that I'm going, man, you mean I got to go faster than a lot of bullets go? Gee, many Christmas. Anyhow. But I was very blessed. And, you know, I think <clears throat> from my uh, background, uh, it's my dad being a preacher and dad coming. We went to church three or four times a week. But, you know, I, I knew pretty much about the Bible. And I, I really liked Proverbs a lot. And it talked about, you know, pride and different things like that. So I was always very cognizant of that. And I think one of the things I've said this many times, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, do everything like you're doing it under the Lord. And so when I was a kid, when I mowed the lawn, wash my dad's car, anything I did, I did it like I was doing it under God, you know. And so that really did change a lot of things in my career because every stunt I did, you know, I wanted to do my absolute best. And I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to glorify God and what I did. And because, of the, um, you know, my trust in him. And I just, I never got excited about things because I knew, um, you know, I knew where I was going if anything happened to me. Not to say that I didn't get hurt a few times, but usually I got hurt when I was showing off on a motorcycle or something like that. But um, yep. anyhow, uh, stunt-wise, you know, I broke my back and a couple of things like that. But that was, you know, just uh, poor rigging by the Part of the job. Uh, anyhow. Hey Sam, we've been talking nearly an hour, and I'm cautious. You know, we've, we've we sort of said put an hour aside, and I don't want to. I don't want to go over. And you know, we said this when we we spoke to David Kincannon. Um, we're going to need to have you back on for 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 part. You know, for part two, and maybe we get you and David uh, to to get in the same room together, and, and we call you both to kind of share some more stories. But having I don't you know, for, so if whatever you guys want to do, I mean, I'm sitting up here in my office and looking at it how beautiful it is and i'm just going to go for a mountain bike ride when i finish with you guys so i love but it I, well, it's, or it's fine with me whatever whatever's good for you well we'll leave we'll let you go for your ride while the sun's up because it, it is it is late in the day but i'm going to ask you one last question that i want to i sure. think is a good note to finish on and i think it's going to be a bit of a substantial answer as well but you've lived a remarkable life very interesting you know, it's, it's almost unbelievable in the stories that you're saying, you know, I'm in my early, early 30s, Felix is in his mid 30s. I'm sure he's sitting here going, you know, 2022, this is somewhat incomprehensible to us. You know, the the adventure, the action, the, the, the you know, the careers you've had. What advice would you give to the people listening on quite simply just how to live, you know, life? Well, I think, you know, the main thing I think is, you know, you better have a good relationship with the Lord. And the second thing is that, you know, I don't think you should limit yourself in any way. I always looked at things and I said, hmm, if they can do it, I can do it. And, you know, I think the main, there's no substitute for preparation. When I went into NASCAR racing, I was the only guy that was working out. And I finished in the top 10 in my first couple of races. And I didn't, I'd never raced NASCAR. And here I'm racing against Petty and Earnhardt and these guys. But I was in such good shape. And, you know, I said, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. And, you know, so don't limit yourself. I would say to anybody, don't limit yourself, but be open to opportunities. You know, I mean, if I told you that the story of how I became a stuntman, you'd laugh. Huh. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> I have to look back on those things and I said, Man, you know, I felt like I was in a canoe going down a river without any paddles, and the current just took me where it wanted. And, uh, but so, you know, that would be my, and be honest, be honest, and don't think more of yourself than you should. And um, that's probably the best advice I could give somebody. I don't know. Um, if I thought about it, maybe I could come up with better things but you know and, I think that's pretty you know, good I think treating everybody the same I mm. never treated you know whether it was Tom Stafford or astronauts or Jaeger and I became great friends and but I treated everybody the same and that's how Paul did 
Paul treated everybody the same. He, we'd be sitting in his dressing room, and a, and a Brip would walk by, and he'd say, hey, come here a minute. And the guy would just kind of look, oh, what does he want? And he'd say, hey, I want you to try my popcorn. Tell me what you think. <laughs> I love it. Hey, that's good advice, Sam. Yeah, but I mean, that's – Paul was humble, and he didn't think more of himself than he should have. And, uh, I mean, he – and I, that's my advice to people. And I think that's why I had the success I did is because I was humble, and I and people knew I was sincere. And be sincere and don't use anybody. I never used anybody. And that's a big, big thing. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining. This is uh, this has been hey, a fantastic. By the way, David, David Ken Cannon's a real deal, man. Yeah, yeah. We learned we learned that the, you know, we, we learned that the fun way chatting to him. We're like, oh my god, we need to have him back on because it's sort of you, you you just you scrape the surface and then you start learning about things and then you start chatting and hey, same same to you, Stan. You're the real deal, and and, and we mean that. We're gonna we're gonna have to organize another chat with the both of you, uh, and kind of well, hear what you, you guys have got up to. Thanks again, and uh, you know, if you'll tell me what you want to talk about, maybe I can be more prepared, or you know, I can send you some things. And uh, this is like, great. I got, just... I got a whole bunch of stuff a couple of days ago because my son keeps saying, "Dad, they're saying there was no sonic boom and this and that." He said, "I know there. Was. I was there." He said, "But you got any proof from the Air Force and all these studies?" And I said, "Yeah." So I sent him a bunch of stuff, and so anything you want, you just tell me, and I'll get it. Incredible. Point. I love Thank it. You. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your ride and uh, we'll chat to you soon. Felix, what a absolute Gent. legend. Gent. Gentleman, legend. I want to sit next to Stan for a day and just chat. What would be your – you've got to spend 24 hours with, with mm. Stan. What do you do with him? I just sit and listen and I just ask questions. I just, I just feel like he's from an era – and he's got stories and he kind of needs to sit down and have a podcast of his own or document it in some way. Cause I just feel like he has so many kind of stories from a, a time that's no more. You know what though? I reckon, I reckon you get more out of him because he, yeah. he sort of opened up over time. I reckon yeah. if you get him to take you for a drive. Uh, a drive or yeah. yeah, mountain biking with him. I, I thought about that, but I think you'd both get puffed. Yeah, oh, it was impressive. He was he was darting out for an evening mountain bike after after our call. How old would he, he'd be a, a fairly mature gentleman these days? I think he's late seventies. Seventies, yeah, at least. If not early eighty. He he held up. He held up well. I mean, I, I think he is a true true uh, privilege that we could we could chat to him. All right. Well, let's let's the interview's done. We'll we'll we'll, we'll chat to him again hopefully at some point. Uh, thank you so much to, to Stan and uh, to everyone involved in putting it together. That's very a um, lot of work behind the scenes there. Also, thank you to Artem, of course, for mm. sponsoring this episode. Andy, anything else people need to know? If you want to join our Discord to tell us how much you love the chat with Stan, you can do that via a link that we'll put in the show notes. Of course, give us a five-star review. Tell all your friends. Follow us on Instagram, ot.podcast. Uh, and, of course, if you want to email us with your cool watch stories, OT at the podcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, Felix, we will see everyone next week. Love it. Chat to you later.